said, open up worship. So many things went through my mind. Sue and I woke up one night, middle of the night, and we were thinking about what, what Bill Vanderbush preached about, about the glory of God. But then this morning I woke up and I had to change gears. I have to tell you about my dad, when he, when he died, he, uh, he was a man that said, you know, just about anything could be fixed. And uh, so he left me a, an old cupboard out of the kitchen from many years ago. Old gray cupboard, had a little vice on it. And so many times since he's passed away about nine years ago that I have went to that cupboard and found something I needed. And I believe that Jesus, when he died, had the same thing for you. You know, go to his cupboard, pull open his drawers, take what you need to get fixed. We all need fixing, you know? We all need to improve. And uh, so the inventory that God has in there for you is boundless. It, it is. So dig in, enjoy. One thing I found, I gotta tell you this. One thing I found in there was a little battery tester. And I thought, hmm, it, it's one that slides up and down, fits all kinds of batteries. And I thought to myself, we should have one of them at church. So people, you know, like when they measure you, you know, and when you go in for, you know, they can slide it down on your head and we can see how well charged you are. <laughs> It's not only for what you do out there, but it's for yourself. Yeah. If you see that you're low on charge, you can do something about it. Go to that drawer. Amen. Let's worship.
kids, we're gonna have, we're gonna take communion together. So if I could have all of the kiddos find the adult you came with, except for those of you who had a sleepover at my house, you need to find your mom or dad. <laughs> so all the kiddos find your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa. Sit with your parents or guardian or parental figure for this time of communion. If you've been asked to help serve communion this morning, you, you can go ahead and go talk to Alicia. She'll get you set up with your trays. We're going to take communion together this morning. While we're doing some of the setup and, and such, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, at Living Word Chapel, we practice open communion, which means that we practice... Open communion. <laughs> Which means that um, we don't have an expectation that you have gone through some class to take communion. You don't have to be a member of our church to take communion. Um, and we don't practice first in first communion, also meaning that moms and dads, we leave it up to you, grandmas and grandpas, guardians, to make the decision whether your kids are ready to take communion or not, and that if they have questions, they're bringing them to you. <laughs> right? That we... we, we believe that some of our youngest ones have like a purity of heart and a level of understanding of what communion is, maybe better than those of us who have gone through the classes and who have done all the things and grown up on the pews of the church, right? So mom, we don't have a first, moms and dads, we don't expect you, uh, we, we let you make that decision whether your kids are going to have communion today or not. Um, and I've asked a couple of teams of people to come serve you this morning. So if you have trays, turn and face, face all your friends. I've asked some teams of people to serve this morning who um, who um, specifically were highlighted to me this week that represent some stories of some family and generational reconciliation. So we have over here, we've got Logan and his grandma, Renee. Um, I'm just going to ask you guys, and I don't know all the details of all the stories, right? But I know some details of some of the stories. So, Renee, can you imagine, like, four or five years ago, serving communion with Logan in a church? <laughs> <laughs> or Logan, vice, vice versa? Could, would this have been any part of your five-year plan? No. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I believe that, you know, grandmas and grandpas speak into generations that they don't even quite know what's coming down the path, but they pray for their kids on a generational level. And I know that Renee has been praying for Logan, and this is an example of just answered prayer across generational lines. So we're just so grateful for that. <laughs> Some other people who are going to be serving you today are Chase and his daughters, Ren and Lila. I won't go into all the details, but Chase being able to stand here with, his, with two of his kids is a miracle. Any of you moms and dads who have estranged relationships with kiddos? This is, a, this is a testimony to you. The Bible says that testimony is prophecy. So if he can do it for one, he can do it for another. Even those of you who are like, I don't know, it's too late. Too much time has passed. Too much has happened. No. Nope. Testimony is the spirit of prophecy. And this testimony right here, I also have another fun thing that I get to watch with Chase and that we get to watch with Chase and his family is that he's here with his fiance and Lila's mom and there's all these extended like layers of healing that are breaking general generational curses for these little ones and so just like we have Renee as a grandma praying for her family we have a father in the house who's breaking stereotypes amen amen do you guys want to stand with the guy you're with? Or do you... <laughs> you can turn. Yeah. 
<laughs> this is a this is a fun little combination of humans right here. <laughs> So we have, yeah, super fun, says the husband. <laughs> so this is Denea and her son, Bentley. This is Denea's mom and Denea's stepdad, right? I'll, what's that? Bonus dad. We don't believe in step or half or anything, right? Also in this building is Denea's dad and bonus mom. And siblings also, like... It took me a long time to figure out who belongs to who in this group. <laughs> yeah, stop trying. And here's the other amazing thing, that there's another person who comes to church who couldn't be here today that's a part of this beautiful conglomeration, who is the biological grandma of an, another estranged relationship, but she's here as family. They're, like, family is not about agreeing. It's not about bloodline. Family is about unity. And so I've asked these groups of people to help serve communion this morning because I really just believe that God is like continuing to do a work. We, we said it made a statement in 2020 that one of the things that we believe is that God is doing something in families. Amen. And we know that because there's a war on the family. And God's ordination is for families. He's, he's for your family. And he's for the reconciliation of that family, whatever that looks like. And so I really wanted these people who are living out a testimony, and trust me, it's not all pretty, right? It's not all pretty. <laughs> Just because we're all sitting in church today does not mean that we got it like all figured out in all these family dynamics. But these people are here to set a beautiful example for you that if he's done it for one, he could do it for another. And so I really wanted them to be involved in serving communion today. Um, and you guys, why don't you, so Chasen and Lila and Ren, if you guys want to head to this I'll give you guys, since you have one hand, I'll give you the smallest section. So they're going to serve this side. The four of you, if you guys want to serve this middle section, and Logan and Renee, if you would serve this section here. And when you receive your communion, just hold on to it. We're going to take it all together. We're going to pray into a few things today. So when you receive your bread and receive your cup, just hold them, hold them until we're all together, until everybody's been served. It's so hard, isn't it, Libby? If we just want to like nibble on the bread, it's so hard. It's so hard, isn't it, Bryn? It's hard to just hang on to it. Moms and dads, guardians, make sure you're talking to your kids that are sitting with you. Why are we doing this? What is this for? Why are we, moms and dads, make sure you're explaining this to your kids? If you're an adult sitting with an adult and you're not sure, ask them. <laughs> what are we doing? Why are we doing this? The two of us up here still need, yeah, thank you. in their juice. Thanks, guys. Can you just give these serving teams a hand? Thank you so much for serving. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> Everybody's like, uh, you told me to hold my cup. I'm trying not to spill this red juice on my white shirt. Sorry, I set you up. Sorry. Thanks for serving. We'll use our words. <laughs> First, yeah, there we go. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, it says, I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. 
The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. And when he distributed it to the disciples, then he distributed it to the disciples and said, Take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, This cup reveals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it, and whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26, this is so beautiful. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. Whenever we do this, we're retelling his story. Every time we're doing, we do this, we retell his story. We just reminisced about a few stories here of the goodness of God. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, it was not simply for our salvation, which is all, when I say only, we're fully aware of what a big deal that is. But it's mind, it's spirit, it's body, it's soul, it's emotions, it's family that Jesus died on the cross to save every ounce of every part. And every time we do this, we're retelling that story. You know, and the Bible says we examine our hearts to make sure that we're not doing this out of vain repetition, so we're not just taking the cup and slamming it down and being mindless about what we're doing, right? That we take it with a reverence for what we do. First, to stand in awe of the story, not only for what he's done in our life, but what he's doing in our life and through our life and for those around us and for those who are we are yet still contending for, right? So go ahead and take the bread. Jesus, we just thank you so much for the broken body that you gave this for us to remember the salvation, to retell the story, to, to reclaim your goodness in our lives. As we take this bread today, God, we take in your life. We take in your testimony and let our lives from here be retelling the story. Jesus, go ahead and receive the bread. You guys get to keep chewing. I got to try to swallow and start talking. <laughs> then we take the cup. When we lift this cup, we, we take the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of our families, over the doorpost of our homes, over the doorpost of our heart. On the Passover, when they painted the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, it said that, no, nope, you don't get to come in here. Not on my watch. Not on my watch, right? So we take the blood of the lamb painted on the doorpost of our hearts, on the doorpost of our families, on the doorpost of our minds, of our physical bodies, and over our salvation. And we say, no enemy, you don't get to, you don't get to come here. Pass over us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And receive the juice. Thank 
I want the kids back up here with me for just one moment. Oh, did they all leave already? They're all gone. They're all literally Lila's here. <laughs> Friends here. If you're between the ages of four and 12, come on down, turn and face your, face your family. Feet on the floor, please. Feet on the floor. Good job, Caleb, having your feet on the floor. <laughs> Good job, turn and face our family. Extend your hands to our, our children's church attendees. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful generation of kids. We get the opportunity and privilege to raise and to train. We take them under our wing. We anoint them with the beard oil, the oil that runs off of our beard. That's what it talks about. The oil runs down from generation to generation, from generation to generation. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity and bless our kiddos as they go to Children's Church. Amen. Amen. All right. Go on back, everybody. All right. A few announcements. We have Bible Blitz with Bruce. That's back up and running this week, um, Monday nights. It's really good. We're in Hebrews 6 this week, so come on um, to that class if you're able. Women's Weekly Thursday nights, every Thursday night. I promise to have good cell phone service and my book with me this week. <laughs> Women's Weekly, that's Thursday nights. Um, meeting Place Worship, yay, that's this week. Meeting Place Worship on Friday night. Turn, turn on the air conditioner, Chris Lyman. Get it going. <laughs> Friday night at 7 o'clock. We just get together with a bunch of people in the community, whoever wants to show up, and we do worship together. It's super yes. fun, super fun. We love it. Um, next weekend, this is an important one. Next weekend, you're not going to be here. You're not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. Because you're going to be at my house. <laughs> Yeah, so church is at our house next week, so no service in this building. We're having an outdoor service at our house, and then after service, we'll do a backyard barbecue and yard games and bouncy house and all the things. There is an address. You just have to be led by the Spirit. Just like that. <laughs> yes, we, how do we, what's the best? All the signs are on the church, but they don't serve you have the address. Have the address, yes. They, it might also be on our website, but I don't see my website person, so it might also be there. But if you can't find it, text me, call me, your mom, somebody. <laughs> we'll get you there. Yeah. Yes. Um, and for that, the church is providing all of the grilled meat we're going to grill out, but if you guys could please bring a dish to pass. So potluck on the sides, and if there's desserts, bring a lawn chair. Um, it's going to be really fun. We're going to do some indoor, some outdoor. So I know some people are not super comfortable with being outside the whole time. So some indoor, kind of open up the patio doors, open up the deck, and indoor outdoor service. Indoor outdoor, but not as scratchy as the indoor outdoor carpet. Right? <laughs> not quite so scratchy. All right. There it is. There's all the information, except for the address. All right, um, and for tithes and offerings, you guys are generous. You're a generous bunch of people. Continue to be a generous bunch of people. Um, we we use our finances to give into the community and to just take care of the temporal needs. But we also have some dreams and visions, some things we're moving into. So continue to be generous with your tithes. Give according to the joy of your heart. It's not like a. It's not again just like communion. It's not vain repetition. It's not something we do out of obligation. It's because of the joy of our heart, the positioning of our heart that we give both tithes and offerings. So if you have that with you, your checkbook, your wallet, your phone, however you text to give, the Venmo, the PayPal, all the things, just hold it out. And we say, Jesus, we thank you for financially providing for us. We thank you that we give our dollars as soldiers into the kingdom. May they continue to advance your kingdom. And, and Father, I just thank you that you've placed joy in our hearts for generosity that we, we know that you, you are always so, so good and faithful, and let us join in your generosity, and let us join in your joy of generosity, in your holy name. Amen. 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 Sean Michael Higgins. Woo! You know, you look at this here, and I just say, like, way too many vegetables. Like, the grills weren't made for grilling vegetables. Yes, come on, thank you. I mean, who's gonna cut up a cob of corn that small? That's just a teaser, too. Cucumbers on the grill? 
Whatever it is, I ain't eating it. <laughs> wow, it's been quite the week. I had another car stolen. That just happened this morning. So, yeah, I was on the phone in the back. So they found it. It's in St. Anthony. So um, supposedly, if if you want to get a, a free car, come to Daymakers, take it out of the parking lot, <laughs> use it for the night. I saw they stopped at Cowboy Jack's. So we're just going to release. We're not going to go as far as the last guy, but we'll just say, Jesus, just get all these guys. Maybe there was a call to my last prayer to say, I did say people steal more of my vehicles. You heard me say it. Yeah, okay, God, we can be done with that. We're good. <laughs> we don't need any more theft in my in that. But, but I do say, you know, I just do, I do want to release forgiveness and blessing on, on that man that he can find Jesus or female, if that's who it was, because um, it's... It, they're wearing the costume, you know, you guys remember from Monday? They're wearing the costume. So we'll talk a little bit about that. It was an absolutely wonderful Monday night. If you were here, holy, holy, holy. The Lord showed up in a powerful way. The speaker was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, if you haven't heard that, check it out on our website. It is absolutely amazing. And uh, Eden asked me, she goes, what did he speak about? And I was like, for like five minutes, I was like, well, it was like, you know, uh, um, God is, he's really good, and uh, he wants you to be really good to everybody. And, and, and you're like, and love, you know, God likes it when we love everyone. And it's really hard to explain. Uh, I had some conversations about it, though, after it was done, and two conversations that stood out is one, uh, a guy said, it preaches really well, but can you live it out? It preaches really well, but do you live it out? And the second one was actually a couple people. Oh, I knew that. He just worded it in a better way. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. Well, how come you're not manifesting 30, 60, 100 times fruit in your life? I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it inside of what, in the, in the manifestation of what's going on around you. So uh, it might be a little bit of a hard message today. So if those of you aren't in the mood for it, you can find the door now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not going to be that hard of a message. But um, I do want to start it off with the preface I started off last week. God's conviction is always meant to show us where he wants to insert more of himself. Not to give us shame or condemnation or guilt. God doesn't reveal and convict behavior in you that, that is bad in order to make you feel worse. He says, hey, that right there, we're not going to let that go on anymore. That right there, that needs to change. And the second thing is grace is not intended to allow you to stay where you are. Grace is the gift that allows you to restart and try again. It's not like, well, I've been doing this my whole life. I'm just going to put grace on it. No, that's not what grace is intended for. Grace will get you from point A to point B, but it's not meant for you to stay at point A, uh, at A point two. It's meant from A, well, maybe we'll say A to C. It's not meant to keep you at B. I got a lot. Everyone's like, letters and too early in the morning. <laughs> did you just do math with letters? I don't know if I did or did. I, it was like a Google Maps thing. Yeah, school didn't even start it. Um, so the title of this message today is Live and Let Live. You know, if we come alive then the world around us actually comes alive. And how do we become fully alive? We gotta grasp on to that new covenant reality that Bill Vanderbush was talking about on Monday. See, the world around us, one of the coolest things about Jesus, I, I got to listen to the, the book of, Ma of Mark this week. That's the one I picked and um, I, went for, I went, it's relatively short, so I even got to jump into some of Luke. And the one thing I see in Jesus is that he never looks at anybody and sees them as the enemy. He always looks at somebody and sees how the enemy has them as a slave. He always looks at someone and says, that person is trapped under the slavery of sin. I need to free them from that. And even if those people are offensive, there's, a, there's one chapter where they take Jesus to the end of a cliff and they're about to toss him off. That's, that's not a good sermon. They're about to kill him before his time, and he slips through the crowd, and he never once judges them. He realizes, look at the sin, or look at the slave, look at how much of a slave they are 
to the enemy of this world and to the enemy of our soul. So we get into this world and we start to have a really, really hard time at looking um, at people the same way. Get stabbed in the back, get a couple cars stolen, you know, <laughs> borrow some more money they don't pay you back. Look at your political leaders that you don't like. Ex-girlfriends, ex-wives, ex-husbands, ex-boyfriends. I had to bring it up. I had to get close to home right away. And it's a really hard time to look at them and go, gosh, when they behave poorly, that's not really them. That's not the God-given gift that they are to this world. That is them under the compulsion and spell of the evil one that I'm called to release grace in order to defeat him in their life and in the life of those around me. See, it's not that easy to look at people and say, oh gosh, didn't Bill Vanderbush say that nobody's unclean? But that person's kind of bleeding all over me, kind of hurting me. We don't stay in that abusive spot. We don't stay trapped in that reality. But what we do is we do not release judgment over it. We release forgiveness over it. Okay. You guys kind of see where I'm going with that. So I want to start with the Bible verse. Matthew 7, 12 through 14. I'm going to be reading out of the Passion Translation. So that's Matthew 7, 12 through 14. I'm going to be flipping all over today. In everything you do, be careful. This is Jesus talking. Red letters. In everything you do, be careful to treat others in the same way you'd want them to treat you. For that is the essence of all the teaching of the law and the prophets. Now that's pretty cool. So in order to fulfill the law, like Jesus said he was doing, uh, treat others in the same way you'd want them to treat you. Enter through the narrow gate. Because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and the difficult way leads to eternal life. So few even find it. Now if you think about that as the uh, evangelical way of viewing heaven and hell, it sounds like it's talking about eternity. Oh, very few get to heaven. We all know that's not true. If you believe in Jesus and you confess him as Lord and you believe in your heart, you have found salvation. Finding salvation is just the entrance into a whole reality that we have in front of us, that we have access to. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It's like coming to my house and only standing in the entryway and never coming in for the actual meal. There's so much more than salvation. Now, salvation is the greatest gift that humanity has ever received because if there's no doorway in, you can't enjoy the meal to begin with. So as you enter into salvation, so that's where a lot of us, especially in this evangelical way of thinking, we stop and we say, I made it. No, you didn't make it. You haven't even taken your shoes off. You haven't even eaten a meal with the Lord. You haven't even begun to walk into all that he has to offer you. Every little bit. It says God has lavished all spiritual bless blessings onto us. In Ephesians 1, all lavished, past tense, on your life. Whether the only thing is, is you don't realize it yet. So we enter into the narrow gate. That is not salvation. That is the kingdom way of thinking. That is the spot where you get to decide, am I going to do this like everyone else? Because it says, broad is the path. Everybody chooses that way. Everybody chooses revenge and resentment. And yeah, I'm going to lie on my taxes a little bit. Or it's okay if I just look at that girl over there. Or yeah, I know I shouldn't be talking to this guy, but I'm not going, I, I, I'm going, everyone else does it. Broad is the path that everyone else chooses. Jesus says, though, enter through the narrow gate. God, I'm hurt right now. But I want to choose the narrow gate. What's it look like? God, I don't have enough money. And I know if I don't, I feel in my heart like I'm supposed to give. I'm supposed to be generous. I'm supposed to, but, but I, I have this 
feeling of lack, but that's how everyone else feels. What do I do in this moment? What's countercultural? What's actually, actually opposite? Because see, Jesus came and he flipped the whole thing upside down on its head. He says, Peter, we need some money for the temple tax. Go get a coin out of a fish's mouth. Every time I fish, I... <laughs> Speaking of fishing, I got to go fishing with Terry Coon this week. That was great, yeah. Logan's happy about it. We didn't get quite the harvest we wanted, but we did get a harvest of stories and, and good times in relationship building, so that was great. I learned a lot about uh, the history of Forrest. Uh, I always try to... He's the historian around here, so... But enough about Terry and our fishing trip. Um, I want to get back to the narrow gate. When you enter up against it and you're standing in front of it, it always comes with a little bit of pushback, a little bit of fear. It's a risk. If you don't have enough money to pay your bills and you feel God's calling you to be generous in a certain situation, that's a risk. That, that, if, if you've entered into work and you see somebody doing something and saying something you believe you need to stand up for and you speak up, that's a risk. If you bring somebody into your home, you know shouldn't be there. But you feel God said, open the door. That's a risk. And as you push through that gate and walk through to the other side, guess who's standing right there to give you a hug? It ain't me. He wraps you up. And you feel something, like I talked about a couple weeks ago, the, on the other side of it is a little bit more peace. It's a little bit more joy. It's a little bit more freedom. It's a little bit more righteousness. It's a little bit more manifestation of him in your life. Is that 30, 60, 100-fold increase that he promises. That's a promise. We sing all God's promises are yes and amen. And I bet you there's some of you who sit out there and go, well, I wonder what those promises are. Well, one of the promises is that if you fully trust in the Lord your God and you serve him in all your days and in all your ways and you take risks in the way that he's asked you to, on the other side of those risks is increase that's 30, 60, and 100. Not just double, not just quadruple. You're going to find yourself in a place you didn't even know you could be in a year. And then after that, you're going to find yourself in a place you didn't even dream possible in five years. And I'm not talking riches and wealth. I'm talking freedom and happiness happiness and joy. But it comes at some expense. I heard Matt speak last night. It was absolutely wonderful. And he said, yeah, whoever was there, that was great. Uh, yeah, that was great. One of the things I love that he said is that he was going to pray to God uh, and ask him to help him, but he wasn't going to expect him to do all the work. But the cool thing about God is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light because really you stand at the doorway and you get yourself in a position where you at least have an opportunity to try something new, to try the way that the kingdom asks us to try. And when you finally step through, it's just a decision. Man, is it hard. You guys who've been there know what I'm talking about. You're in a situation where all of a sudden, I know that I know that I know that God wants me to do this to forgive this person, to move in this direction. And it's just a step. But man, it's a hard step. So keep that in mind as we go through this. So, loving people enables us to see them how God actually sees them. Because that's what we need in this whole thing. We need the glasses of the Holy Spirit to come on over our eyes. Because God created CJ before the foundation of the... Uh, the earth and what Bill Vanderbush said when he was here is is that God made up his mind about CJ before CJ ever had time to screw that up so I gotta say that again God made up his mind about Terry Kuhn before Terry Kuhn ever had an opportunity to let God down 
God made his mind up about you before you could even screw it up. So what we do when we, in it, when we put on, uh, when we allow God, when we decide we're going to love people, when we decide we're going to live in that, is we put on these glasses of the Holy Spirit and we decide we're going to look at them through the lens of God and ask God to remove this costume, this worldly stuff that's got them held down so we can see deep inside of them. And even if we can't see who they are, we're going to say, at least we know it's not what I'm seeing manifested right now in front of me. See, there's a bigger reality going on around you than you even realize. We're so stuck in the natural, but the natural is going to pass away one day. The Spirit has been here from the beginning and will be here until the end. And that's the more real thing that's going on in our life. And we miss it. We don't see it because we're too caught up in the distraction of the natural around us. And therefore, we lose out on what God's doing and has been doing since the beginning of time. And today I've come to kind of jumpstart that back, like, like shock you, like take out that defibrillator and say, y you're just... I think that's a pretty good elect electricity thing. Is to say, look it. Yes, we've all faced disappointments. Yes, what's going on around us doesn't match up what we're talking about. And sometimes we're depressed and sometimes we're anxious and some, but that's not the ultimate reality of your life. The ultimate reality of your life is what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we've been struggling since then to learn how to fully accept it. And we hear these great preachers, Bill Vanderbush can come in here and preach a phenomenal message. And the next thing you know, you've locked that in your head as, oh yeah, I get that. And you never do anything about it. And then when the next person tells you that message, you go, oh yeah, I know that. But yet there's no fruit manifested in your, in your wake. There's no trail behind you. See, the Christian life is not easy. The Christian life is not hard. It was always meant to be impossible. Let that sink in. Without Jesus, it's impossible. One of the things that stood out to me in the gospel about Jesus too is he was completely obedient to the Lord, to, the, to his Father, but he was always moved by compassion. He was always moved by love for the people around him. He knew Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead, yet he still wept. Why did he weep? at the tomb when he knew he knew on the other side of this was going to come unbelievable joy but he couldn't fathom the absolute agony of the people around him and was thinking i cannot believe this is the human experience and he wept because he had so much compassion so as we start to move into a season of increased supernatural activity and miracles and healings and the things that we've seen time and time again we have to realize it's not out of a compulsion to build up our spiritual muscles it's always got to be out of compassion the narrow gate is covered in love that's why he ties the narrow gate to treat everyone like you want to be treated it's rooted in love. It's rooted in compassion. You have to be able to look at somebody who's clawing you, who's hitting you, who's treating you horribly, and to say, that person, that poor person, that poor, poor person, you might have to get removed. See, I have an arsenal, I have a network of people. So if somebody gets a little bit too challenging to deal with, if they're being a little bit too abusive, if it's getting to be a little bit of a, a, a situation where I'm putting myself in trouble, I network out. I got people to surround in and come in and help. You guys with me so far? Oh yeah, I got a I got a great scripture. I got one coming right now. I got one right now. Here we go. Here we 
What a great transition. So yeah, hey, there's not a lot of leeway on this subject when it comes to the kingdom. I'm so glad you did that. That is great. <clears throat> so for forgiveness or offending? You only got two options. Offended definition is resentful or annoyed. And forgiveness, uh, re the definition of forgive is to stop feeling resentful and annoyed. That's literally <laughs> the definition. <clears throat> this is a truth. This is a truth and I want you guys to hear this. As a Christian, you have, vo you have um, given up your right to be offended. You have no leg to stand on when you come to the Lord in offense. You have no right in the kingdom of God. You can wear it all you want all day long. You can take it in and you can make it part of your life, but you're going to find distance in between your ability to walk in peace and joy because there is no wiggle room for offense in the kingdom. So here we are. We're in Matthew 18, verse 23. The lessons of forgiveness in heaven's kingdom realm can be illustrated like this. This is Jesus talking. There once was a king who had servants who had borrowed money from the royal treasury. He decided to settle accounts with each of them. As he began the process, it came to his attention that one of his servants owed him $1 billion. So he summoned the servant before him and said to him, pay me what you owe me. When his servant was unable to repay his debt, the king ordered that he be sold as a slave along with his wife and children in every possession they own as, repayment, as payment towards his debt. Who is thankful the IRS doesn't do that nowadays? Okay, so they're not that bad, right? The IRS, we're good. Um, the servant threw himself face down at his master's feet and begged for mercy. Please be patient with me. Just give me one just give me more time and I will repay you all that I owe. Upon hearing his pleas, the king had compassion on the servant and released him and forgave his entire debt. So in the middle of that, what's going on right there is that's us. We owed a billion dollars for our life. And God in his infinite mercy and grace came down and forgave us, okay? No sooner had the servant left when he met one of his fellow servants, who owed him $20,000. He seized him by the throat and began to choke him, saying, You better pay me right now everything you owe me. His fellow servant threw himself face down at his feet and begged, Please be patient with me. If you'll just give me time, I will repay you all that is owed. But the one who had his debt forgiven stubbornly refused to forgive what was owed him. He had his fellow servant thrown into prison and demanded he remain there until he repaid the debt in full. Which is kind of weird because how are you going to make any money in prison? But anyway, when, he asso when his associates saw what was going on, they were outraged and went to the king and told him the whole story. The king said to him, you scoundrel, is this the way you respond to my mercy? Because you begged me, I forgave you the massive debt that you owed me. Why didn't you show the same mercy to your fellow servant that I showed to you? In a fury of anger, the king turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until all his debt was repaid. In the same way, my heavenly father will deal with any of you if you do not re release forgiveness from your heart toward your fellow believers. Yeah, yeah but if you mince that, I'm telling you, you will find all over the Bible, it's not talking about just believers. That's why even uh, one of the Pharisees tries to tap Jesus, or one of the Pharisees tries to trap Jesus in this same way of thinking. He says, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Pharisee goes, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus then begins to talk about the guy that was beaten up and robbed and laying on the side of the road. And the preacher walks by, and the Levite walks by, and the Good Samaritan, which was their arch enemy, that's like ISIS in their eyes, he decides that he's going to help them. And that's where Jesus shuts down this whole, you can't pick and choose who I'm talking about. Right. And even with the, you can't call anyone unclean, the vision that Peter has, 
But what Jesus is saying in this verse is, how can you be so jacked about the mercy God's given you and not release it to the people around you? And like I said, the conviction is not to make you feel bad or to feel like you're doing something wrong. Nobody should come out of this and think, <clears throat> sounds like I'm going to hell because I don't forgive. That's not what's happening in this verse. But what's happening in this verse is Jesus is saying, you better take a good, long look inside your heart. Because what's going on around you, what you're receiving, what you're walking in, if it doesn't flow through you, then it gets stuffed up in you. You're constipated, and you're bloated, and you're stretching in the wrong directions, and next thing you know, it's going to crush you. Because I've come to give life and life more abundant. And if that life doesn't continue to flow from, the, from, from me through you to everyone around you, you just have become a dam, and you ain't overflowing nothing. And the next thing you know, you're just stuck up stubborn and dry. So then you say, wow, do you do this every day? No, no, but I want to, but I ask God to help me. And I know one day I am. One day I will walk in the freedom that God talks about in all of these subjects. I will not waste another day thinking it isn't gonna happen. Each and every one of us out here is predestined for something greater than we can realize. The fact of the matter is that the devil gets inside your head and says, that's not you. You can never achieve that. And he's right, you can't. But Jesus did, and he gave it to you as a free gift. So can I get an amen? It's, a, it's serious, serious business. <clears throat> there was more I was going to kind of dive into today, but I, I think taking on the unforgiveness part is kind of a big deal because it is a big deal. It was a pretty big deal to Jesus. I mean, that, he didn't mince words. He didn't hold back. He didn't say, well, if you give it a good shot, Give it, a, give it a nice try. We talked about that last week. <clears throat> because what, I, what, what this series is, is that I'm in is that, you know, we're supposed to look different than the world around us. Why is America, I, I, I am, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, if I hear another person tell me God has removed his hand from America, I might just slap him across the face with my hand. Because God hasn't removed his hand from nothing. The church is failing to show up in the calling they were destined and given to in the first place. We're supposed to be peacemakers in our community. So if there's no peace, whose fault is it? I'm going to let you sink on that one. God gave us a partnership in the Garden of Eden. And we decided we were going to break that. And when Jesus came on the cross, he reinvited us back into that partnership. That's why we're called co-heirs with Christ. That's why Peter says we partake of his divine nature. That's why Paul says, Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. Well, if he's just trapped in you and the world around you doesn't look any different because he sits on the throne of your heart and goes nowhere else, then who's to blame? God took a bucket of everything that he had to offer and he poured it on the earth. And he said, okay, I'm going to start with 12 of you. Go spread this around. Make a mess. Get that. Spread that everywhere, all over. That's grace. That's love. That's mercy. You cannot exaggerate my grace. You cannot exaggerate my goodness. You cannot forgive too much. You cannot uh, love too much. You can't have too much fun in this world. But you just got to believe it. And like I said earlier... What the Christians have become in some circles, I'm just going to say it as it is, is a dam. Yeah. We're holding back God's goodness and grace that he poured out and saying, well, I don't know if they deserve it, Lord. Right. Well, you didn't deserve it. Yeah. I didn't deserve it. I still don't deserve it. But because of him, now I do. Because of him, we're forgiven. But the coolest thing about it is, we actually get to put 
his righteousness on us. So not only are we forgiven, but that person's dead. We're a new creation. Therefore, we're innocent, as if we'd never done anything in the first place. And because we're innocent and have never actually slipped up, we can put on the power that Jesus gave us and walk around and start whooping the devil's butt. But this guy up here, he likes to talk us out of it. Blame the devil for a lot of stuff. Oh, devil. Oh, that guy, that stinking guy. It's holding me down. Nah, you're just making stupid decisions. That stinking devil. Nah, you're letting yourself meditate on stuff you shouldn't be meditating on. <clears throat> I don't meditate, Sean. You ever have you ever sit and ruminate on your negative thoughts? Yeah, you meditate. <laughs> we live in an age where it is absolutely 100% like you have to try hard to not put the Bible in you. You got 25,000 translations, you've got audio, you've got visual, I got picture Bibles, I've got coloring Bibles. I'm telling you, if you're meditating on only the negative and not putting any of the positive word of God into your life, then you're, you're missing out on what it means to really step into believing this stuff. Because <clears throat> if we don't eat food, guess what? You get hungry. Say you're super healthy, you eat really healthy. You ain't ate for three days, and now there's just a bunch of junk food in front of you. You're going to have an all-you-can-eat buffet because you're starving. That's how it is with us in meditating on the negative. If you fasted positivity in your life, if you fasted scripture, if you fasted worship music and all you're pumping is gangster rap and all sorts of other horrible stuff, you're going to be more apt to just let that sink in deeper and deeper because you're hungry for something. And if you're hungry for something and you're not going to God's table, the devil is more than happy to serve you up a plate of negativity. But it's your choice on whether you're going to eat. I had to drive myself to the McDonald's drive through you know. I had to get out my credit card. I had to make the purchase of the bag of fish fillets. Can't have just one. Got to have five. I can't blame McDonald's because that's what was on their menu. <laughs> just because I just like I can't blame the devil because I sat around and hung around with him for a little bit too long and looked at his stuff for a little bit too long and listened to his things for a little bit too long. I'll be back one of these days with a nice pump up, let's go message. Trust me, I love giving those to you. But I, I really feel strongly in this next season that, that God wants to bring us back. He wants to humble us in the center of what's really going on. He wants us to, he, he, we, we ha, we are, this is maybe one of the most grace-filled churches I've had the privilege of being a part of since the day I started 11 years ago. I, I, and anyone who uh, believes that with me, just give me a shout of praise right now. <laughs> but we have to be ca careful that we, that we don't allow that grace to become a sin tolerant place or a mediocre Christian place. We're still called to look like something. We're still called to be something. We're still called, we're supposed to be a light to the world. We're supposed to be salt to the earth. And when salt loses its flavor, when all we do is just sit in the middle of, of, of who we already are and don't push forward to become more salty and brighter, we, we become useless and we get trampled on by everyone else around us. And I want to tell you about that verse a second before we go. This is a little extra point. <clears throat> when the church refused to stand up to Donald Trump and his rhetoric, we got trampled by the world around us because we looked like a bunch of cowards who were spineless and would go back and forth on our word. Whether we liked the policy or not, whether we thought he was the answer to our economic problems or not, trust me, when we refuse to get up and be the salt of the world and say, no, you can't talk to people like that. You can't behave like that. Guess what happened to us in the eyes of everyone who got to see it? Trampled on.
trampled on. See some of you out there, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> Both things can live together at the same time. It's okay to have your political opinions because you're an American. It's great. That's the joy of being an American. You can vote for whoever you want. You can support whoever you want. <clears throat> but you're a kingdom. You, you live in the kingdom of God first. With, with a population all over the world. And we got to make sure we're not trading that and picking the broad road. We got to look for the narrow gate. Because I don't want to get trampled on anymore. I don't want to I don't want to see the church getting trampled on anymore. And I want to get real. We got no one to blame but ourselves. But cool thing is, we got grace to restart. Yeah. New every morning. And we got a powerful God that doesn't care how long it took us to figure it out. All he cares about is that we figured it out. And from that moment, you're rocketed into the fourth dimension. Your whole life changes. Everything around you changes. Next thing you know, the front two rows are filled up with your family. And everything in your life is getting different. And God's pouring on 30, yeah. 60, 100, 200, 250, 1,000. See, that's a promise. The promise is, is that if we can wrap our head around this, if we can get behind it, and if we can move forward into it, he's going to back us. He looks for it. He's, I feel like he's just looking for someone to start on fire and he's got a gas can ready to just dump. Hey, we got a burning one over here, Holy Spirit. Let's dump it out. Hey, God, look over here. We got one that wants it. Boom. Fire. Blast. Boom. M80s, all sorts of stuff. I just boom, 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 boom. It's the truth. It's the truth. He it's, it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 11, that his eyes go to and fro, searching the entire earth to look whose hearts are fully his. And when he finds one, he goes, here's the one. Hit him with, some, hit him with that flamethrower, Holy Spirit. I think I said, I don't know if I, I think I said at the last leadership meeting, I was a little tipsy, but I said uh, that somebody was, beer bonging the living water <laughs> because you know that's the whole thing like just let it just let he just it's not enough he will he, he doesn't just say oh we give him a little bit trickle it down here just sprinkle some on no it's like Niagara Falls you get under it and it's every every gift of the Holy Spirit every spiritual blessing that's all I got for you guys today I'm going to leave on that one. Thank you. Just leaving us all cringing like, oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I loved, what, I loved what, what you just said, that extreme grace is not sin tolerance. Whew. Amen. That's that extreme grace looks like giving it, it makes me makes made me think of like when Noah's sons walked into the tent backwards they found him in disgrace right and they walked into the tent backwards and said we're just going to cover that up we see that we see that that's not there's we'll deal with that when he wakes up right extreme grace is not sin tolerance that was really really good don't come here next week, okay? <laughs> God, wait, what? They're just gonna take that clip off the Facebook and like just put it on our website. Don't come here next week. If you guys need prayer for anything, if you're part of our ministry team, would you please stand up? Please stand up. The real ministry team, please stand up. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, and th these are people on our ministry team. Some of them are in the back, but if you guys would come on down for. Um, prayer time. If you need prayer for absolutely anything, if you have not yet given your life to Jesus, now is the time to do that 100% for sure. This is the best day to be um, to put Jesus back in the driver's seat. If you need prayer for absolutely anything else, physical healing, relational healing, uh, financial breakthrough, whatever it is, come see one of these people and otherwise we will see you next week. Love you all. i
a hallelujah.